Hi, I'm Chef Frank. This is Proto Cooks, and today we're making lasagna with a sprinkle of history from Max Miller. My lasagna is a mix of my Italian American upbringing, like what my mom and my grandmother used to make, and uh, my restaurant version. You know, the restaurant version obviously has fancier ingredients. And this is a dish that, you know, it, it came up from Italian immigrants that were introduced to new ingredients and didn't have everything they had at home. So, uh, you know, it developed into what we make it today. And, you know, it's not probably exactly like everyone else's. It's probably not exactly like the Italians do in Italy. Uh, but this is my take on it. And I'm sure everyone has their own recipe and their own way of doing it. So Chef Frank, what is lasagna? And now, that little sprinkle of history I promised you from one of my favorite YouTube channels, Tasting History with Max Miller. Take it away, Max. Over on my channel, Tasting History with Max Miller, we just made a wonderful medieval lasagna called Lozien from England. And then we explored the lasagna family tree. But there was one branch we did not get to, and those are the lasagnas that got out of Italy and Europe and made their way to Ethiopia and America. More like a lasagna that we know today. In 1939, Italy colonized Ethiopia, bringing pretty much only bad things, namely Mussolini, mustard gas, and World War II. But they also brought lasagna, and Ethiopia embraced the dish. They added their own local flavors like coriander and paprika, as well as cheddar cheese. And still to this day, Ethiopian lasagna is a very popular dish all over the country. Now, lasagna's introduction to America was a bit more amicable, seeing as it came over with immigrants from Naples. In Naples, lasagna was made with very expensive meats and was really only eaten around Carnivale. But in America, the ingredients were a lot less expensive, relatively, so they ended up kind of changing up the recipe and making what's a little bit closer to a modern day lasagna. And it was big in the Italian American community in the 1920s and 1930s. Then after World War II, lasagna got another boost as American GIs came back over and wanted to taste a bit of the dish that they had enjoyed over in Europe. As the dish became more popular, it also changed and evolved, sometimes in good ways, and sometimes in less than good ways. Like in 1970, when Julia Child, wonderful Julia Child, made one of her rare missteps with her lasagna a la Francaise. She declared it a great way to use up leftovers, and it included things basically that you could find in your kitchen from whatever you cooked the night before. In her version, there's chicken, cottage cheese, and dried orange peel. What makes it a la Francaise, I have no idea, but the Italian-American community were not fans and gave her quite a bit of flack for it. But it did open up the floodgates to make lasagna more American, not a la Francaise, but a la American, and new recipes started springing up all over. There was a restaurant I used to go to in Phoenix that had Mexican lasagna, and really it was just enchiladas that hadn't been rolled and then were stacked on top of each other. And then a place in New York once gave me uh, Japanese lasagna, which was layers of sushi rice, sushi, and teriyaki chicken. Really a slap in the face to multiple cultures all in one dish. Even now, lasagna is a dish that's just rife with experimentation. Uh, in 2014, a salt-free, dehydrated version was sent up to the International Space Station with astronaut Luca Parmitano, and fairly recently, a German publisher decided to make the world's first edible cookbook, a cookbook you could cook, which was sheets of lasagna that were engraved with stories about cooking. Who needs that? But kind of cool, I guess. Fortunately for us, while lasagna still inspires all sorts of mad creations, an influx of quality ingredients from Italy started flooding the American market back in the 90s. And that's led great chefs like Chef Frank Proto to lift American lasagna back up to something your Italian grandmother could be proud of. Lasagna is basically a casserole. Layers of pasta, sauce with or without meat, and cheese baked in the oven. It's really simple, believe it or not. So this is my version of a really good lasagna. 
two cans of peeled crushed tomatoes, two medium onions diced, two small carrots peeled and diced, one cup of red wine, a quarter a cup of 100% olive oil, not extra virgin, five to six cloves of garlic chopped, one can of tomato paste, four ounces of diced pancetta, three pounds of beef short ribs on the bone, 15 to 20 basil leaves, one small strip of orange rind, black pepper, and of course, salt. The first thing we're gonna do is brown off our meats. And we're starting to build layers of flavor. A lot of times I see people make sauces and they just dump everything into the pot raw and bring it to a boil. That's not what we wanna do. We wanna brown our meats off to get some of that kind of like caramelization on the meat and get those nice brown flavors. In the culinary world, we call this the Maillard reaction, which is uh, proteins and amino acids browning, and it gives these really great savory flavors. So what I'm using here is beef short ribs, and this is cut a certain way. It's called flanken, F-L-A-N-K-E-N. And basically what they do is instead of cutting the ribs like this into long ribs, they cut it across the bones. Now there's two reasons I use this. First reason is that I have a lot of bone here that is exposed and that'll give us some flavor. Also, because it's so thin, it's gonna cook quicker than a big chunk of meat. And I like the fact that it's gonna cook quicker. Uh, one of the other reasons, I have another reason too, is that short ribs that are on the bone uh, that follow the bone usually have less meat on them for some reason, okay? So what we're gonna do first is season these up with some salt and pepper. I get both sides and I season very well. Again, in case you guys didn't know, I use kosher salt. Kosher salt has bigger grains. I hear a lot of comments about, oh, chef, my things are really salty whenever I cook food from your channel. And I understand that because a lot of people are using table salt or iodized salt. If you don't use kosher salt, it's gonna be saltier because one pinch of salt uh, from table salt has more salt in it than a pinch of kosher salt. So I wanna season these really nice. When I season, I try and go up high so I get a good spread. And you'll notice throughout the making of this sauce, and this is gonna be the sauce for our, um, our lasagna, I'm gonna season throughout the process. Okay, so these are seasoned well. I have my quarter cup of olive oil. It goes into my pot. It's smoking lightly or smoking and I, brown, I start browning these off. Drop them in the pan. Don't put too much in the pan. I could probably get away with four pieces right now. Brown them off. I got a pair of tongs over here. And that's what we wanna do. We're gonna brown those off and uh, get them nice and caramelized. Because they're thin, they have a lot of surface area. They start to brown really quickly. That one's not ready yet. When I brown things, I try not to mess around with them too much. I leave them in the pan until they get nice and brown. Sometimes they stick. If it sticks, leave it. It will separate from the pan itself. I have some nice uh, uh, steam coming off. And if you put too much into the pot at this point, these are gonna steam and not brown. So we wanna hear that. You hear that snap, crackle, and pop sound? That's what you want to hear when you're cooking, cooking these. If you hear a hissing like and not like crick, uh, crackling, it's just uh, boiling and you're, get, you're not getting a lot of sear to them. So our last two pieces of meat are browning and I got some nice brown on that. These we're just gonna put aside for a few minutes while we get the next part of our sauce on. Don't throw out any of the juice in there. Don't get rid of any of the oil. Just gonna put these aside for now with my tongs over there. The next thing I'm gonna do is put in my pancetta. Um, I always find that a little bit of pork in your sauce kind of rounds out some of those tomato flavors. I just like pork in my tomato sauce. And I'm just gonna sweat this out or cook it out with not a lot of color, just a little bit of browning, okay? So I guess it's not really a sweat, it's just, it's a light browning, okay? Now, if you just dumped everything in at this point, uh, you'd have a okay sauce, but by doing it in kind of like stages like this, I feel like you'd get a better, uh, richer, deeper flavored sauce, okay? So our pancetta is in, it's giving us some of that beautiful flavor. And I'm gonna throw my onions in now, okay? So I throw my onions in first, 
Uh, they're going to take a little longer than everything else. Well, the carrots and the onions probably take about the same amount of time. But I put my onions in because I want them to start to get some color, okay? If I added the garlic right now, it would probably burn before the onions. So we're going to put the onions in first and start to cook them. I'm going to take a little bit of salt. So you'll see me season throughout the process. Uh, and a little bit of pepper right now. I'll season throughout. The salt's going to draw a little moisture out. It's also going to start seasoning the sauce. Now I'm waiting for these to go from kind of bright white like they are now to a little translucent and slightly brown. Smells amazing. So you can see my onions are starting to get a little translucent. I'm going to add my carrots and my garlic and I'm going to let those kind of cook out. You'll see in a lot of like Italian American food, it's like overpowering with garlic. And I've said this before, is that my grandmother didn't like garlic that much. Um, and as far as Italians go, they do use garlic, uh, but they don't overpower it. We put so much garlic in that you walk out of uh, the restaurant or you walk, or you, you know, someone in, in your family cooks and it's like a garlic bomb. No, you want it as a scent or a fragrance. Uh, you don't want it to be the main flavor. Uh, and I always use fresh garlic. The stuff out of the jars is just garbage. Don't use it. Buy the fresh garlic, chop it yourself. Um, I know a lot of places will sell peeled garlic. Buy that, that's fine. As long as it's garlic that you chop yourself. Beautiful. Okay, the next step I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add my tomato paste, right? Um, I add uh, a fair amount of tomato paste and I feel like the tomato paste kind of gives a nice deep tomato flavor. And I'm just going to put that in there and get it. I'm not going to brown it. I'm just going to cook it and fry it just a little in the fat. And I'm just cooking until I smell tomatoes. The next thing I'm going to do is my wine, all in at once. And all we're going to do with the wine here is let it cook until I don't smell any more alcohol. If you smell it right now, it smells like alcohol. Let me lower the heat so it doesn't splatter everywhere. Uh, and you're cooking it until when you go like this, you don't smell alcohol anymore. I can't smell any more wine, or I smell it, but it's not, I don't smell the booze. Now I'm gonna add my tomatoes. I got a little bit of water here, about two cups. And I'm gonna wash out my bowl but what these tomatoes, uh, or what this water does, is actually gives our tomatoes a chance to cook. Right now it's pretty thick, uh, and if I added it without any water, um, everything would cook down too quickly. And the water is actually, I thought it was just my grandmother trying to clean out cans, but she would put it in there so it has time to cook down, okay? I'm gonna add my uh, strip of orange rind and my basil leaves now as well. A nice heavy hit of salt and some black pepper. And we're gonna let this come to a simmer. Good. Let it come to a simmer, give it a good stir, and let it come to a simmer. Our sauce is simmering. I'm gonna take all of our beef and start nestling it in the sauce. Make sure you splash and get it everywhere. Uh, these are just gonna sit in there and get cooked until tender. See that juice there? We got all that juice. That goes in. I'm going to put a lid on it, but I'm not going to put the lid on all the way. I'm going to leave it off a little. I do want some evaporation, but I do want it to hold in a lot of the moisture. It'll kind of reduce a little bit, not reduce a lot. This will stop it from reducing too quick. Okay? So this is probably going to take an hour, hour and a half, and then we'll come back to it. We have our tomato sauce on. That takes a little while to cook, so in the meantime, we're gonna get our pasta ready. And I have a pasta video, a pasta 101, so we're probably gonna go through this fairly fast. I'll show you how to roll the sheets out, but making the pasta is super simple. And this is what I have for it. I have a kilo or 2.2 pounds of double zero flour, eight large eggs, and of course, salt. What is double zero flour? It's just a finely milled flour from Italy. It's just really fine. It makes a really nice, smooth pasta. The eggs, you can use whatever eggs you have, uh, brown or white or whatever ones you get from the farm, that's fine. I always find the, the nicer farm-raised eggs have bright yellow yolks. So I'm probably not gonna use all of this flour, and I'm gonna do the granny method. I have a fork, 
and I have a uh, bench scraper or a, a bowl scraper. And I'm gonna pour out most of my flour onto the table. I'm gonna save a little just to kind of dust here. And I'm gonna take this and make a really nice big volcano. Make a big volcano. And I'm gonna crack my eggs into the middle of my volcano. Make this volcano big enough so that the eggs don't pour out. If you get any shell in there or any like weird things, I don't know what that is, a little brown speck, get the shell and pull it out. There you go. So eight eggs to about, about two pounds of flour. Um, a hefty pinch of salt, a fair amount of salt. Again, I'm using kosher. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start to whip these eggs, get them really combined well, and as they whip, I'll start to bring my flour in from the edges. And this is gonna make my dough. This is where this piece of plastic comes into play. It's probably like a buck, maybe 79 cents. This is gonna help us scrape and get everything off of the table. I happen to have a marble countertop. I like to do this directly on the countertop. Uh, marble is a great thing for making pasta and pastries. Perfect to do it on the countertop. I, of course, cleaned it before I started. So now that it's kind of getting a little thicker and less fluid, I will add more of my flour in. It's not gonna pour out, right? And what I'm looking for is a fairly dry, but not crumbly pasta dough. Oh, make sure you get it all over the floor and on your shoes. That's always a good thing. So I get my scraper now. I can get rid of my fork and I kind of just cut it in a little. I might not need all of this flour and that's okay, but I'm just gonna kind of cut the flour in so it's not wet before I really get my hands in there. Cool. Okay, so now that it's kind of like not really wet, I take some of this excess flour, just put it on the side, and I start to try and bring this together as one big mass. So like I said, I want this to be dry, but not so dry that it doesn't get smooth, right? So I want it to be a nice smooth dough, but not so dry that I can't knead it, okay? And I find that a lot of people have trouble with this because they make it a little too dry and it's really hard to knead. And then, so you can see that what I just did is if it sticks to my hands too much, I get a little bit of flour, I rub my hands together, and I'm kneading. So when I knead, I'm using my body weight, pushing with my body weight, stiff arms, right? Push this out of the way a little. Give myself, scrape up some of those little nibs, okay? This will be something I can dust with later and really work it in, right? So there you go, that feels good. I fold over and push with my body. Push, fold over and push, make sure you get it everywhere. I don't think I need any more flour. So what's gonna happen to this is after we let it rest, right? Because we're kneading it now and we're getting it very like stretchy, and it's getting, working all the gluten in the flour. So once we let it rest, it's actually gonna soften up a lot. And we don't want it to be too soft so that when we roll it out, it's sticky. So that's why I always err on the side of caution and make this just a little firmer than I think I need to be. Cool, nice. It is a workout. Get a little more respect for those pasta grannies. Uh, I'm pretty good there. What I'm looking for is I press on it and you can see it bounces back. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap this in some plastic and let it rest until we're ready to roll it out. This doesn't need to go in the fridge. Room temperature. For the ricotta mixture, or as they say in Long Island, ricotta, uh, this is what I have. Three pounds of ricotta. This is whole milk ricotta. Three eggs. Three quarters of a cup of Pecorino Romano cheese, grated, black pepper, and of course salt. For the ricotta, this is all that I do. I take my grated cheese, goes right in, my three eggs, and then I season it up and mix it well. Black pepper, salt, okay. I missed a little of my cheese and I just break up my yolks and mix this up really good. Uh, maybe get a bigger bowl. As I always say, just get it everywhere. And then keep this in the fridge until we're ready to assemble. There you go. That's it with the ricotta. Into the fridge.
Next thing we're going to do is roll out our pasta. The pasta is rested. It probably rested for about a half hour, 45 minutes. I have some bench flour, which I can dust everything with. I have my uh, bowl scraper and I have my pasta machine. This pasta machine is amazing. It's called Atlas. I got it 20 years ago when I got married. It's an old granny hand crank one. It works amazing. If you have a fancier one, use that too. If you don't have a machine, use a rolling pin and roll it out as thin as possible. What's great about this is we're not cutting into any sort of shape. We're just doing flat sheets. And I'm gonna make flat sheets all the way here. So I'm gonna take this out of the plastic, uh, but I'm not gonna throw the plastic away. I'm gonna keep one sheet for myself because as I roll out one piece of dough, I don't want this to get dry and get like an alligator skin. So I take my plastic wrap and I just put it on my counter and wrap it. I get my dough and it's really nice. I'm gonna flatten it out, dust it with a little bit of flour, but after it's rolled out, I'm not worried if it dries out a little because we're just gonna boil it. So now we take this, I'm on one, mine goes from one to nine, nine being the thinnest. I'm probably gonna to go to seven or eight, but you always wanna start at the thickest and I roll it through. Once I roll it, I book fold one, two, and basically all that this really does for me is that it makes my, um, it makes my dough or my pasta sheet more uniform. Look how nice and uniform it is. And I'm gonna run that through one more time. And I'm gonna have a nice uniform sheet that goes through. I'm gonna go down the numbers now, right? So just keep going down. I only have to do the book fold once. Keep going down. If you feel like it's sticking, add more flour. If it's fine, don't worry about it. Keep on going down. I'm at about four now. Five. Just remember, when you cook the pasta, it's gonna absorb water and get thicker, so you wanna go fairly thin at this point, right? So I'm probably gonna to go to seven. I'm at six, let it hang down, stretch it out. Oh my gosh, look at that pasta, nice and smooth and silky and beautiful. Okay, I'm gonna go one more, go down to seven, and I think that I'm good on my machine. Uh, again, you, if you know your machine, you probably know it better, um, but this one, I think for my lasagna noodles or pasta noodles for my lasagna, the pasta for my lasagna, I think seven is good. I'm gonna take this sheet and I'm just gonna put it over here and it could dry out a little, then I'll cut it and cook it, okay? So we're just gonna do that one more time. That's what I love about doing lasagna is that there's no shaping after the fact. It's basically just taking the pasta, rolling it into big sheets and then cooking it and you can cut it as you go or you can cut it according to the size of your pan. You can also notice that I do it on the back of my hands. Whenever I hold the pasta, it's on the back of my hands, and I'll show you why, right? So if I pick it up on the back of my hands, I'm not poking through, and that's what I really want. So I usually hold it on the back of my hands. So we're at about six. Look at that, lasagna. All the pasta is rolled out. I have my large sheets. I got a whole table full of pasta. This is gonna be enough pasta for probably two lasagnas at least, okay? Uh, and, and that's a good thing. I like to cook the pasta and use it all in one day. Can you save the pasta? Sure. But what I always say is if you're gonna save the pasta, don't save a ball of dough. Make the shape you want. Either let it dry it out or freeze it in the shape that you want and then cook it when you're ready. But don't save a ball of dough in the fridge. So all I'm gonna do is cut these into, I don't know, maybe that's about almost 11, 12 inches. And if these dry out a little now, I'm not too worried about it because um, they're just gonna get cooked. And if they get a little dry, not a big deal. But the pasta sheets are really nice. I'm just gonna cut them all into about 12 inches. If there are some short ones, I don't mind having some short ones in there. I'll probably have to patch some areas. And you could use a pizza wheel for this or um, a knife, but I don't want to use a knife on my marble. Look at those sheets of pasta, nice and thin. Next thing we're gonna do is cook these and then assemble. So let's cook the pasta, boiling salt and water. I'll throw about three or four sheets in at a time, maybe five sheets. I'm also gonna cook the little scraps. So if it sticks to my table, I just get my little bench scraper or bowl scraper drop it in. It only takes two or three minutes to cook, maybe at the most. I have a sheet tray, a spider, and a little bit of vegetable oil. Normally, I do not like to put oil on cooked pasta, right? But for this, I'm going to do it because I want to have 
separate sheets, okay? We're not trying to really coat the pasta with a sauce. It, the, the pasta's gonna absorb that sauce. So I'm not too worried about having a little oil on my pasta, okay? So these cook for two or three minutes. I take a sheet, drain it really well, get as much water off as I can, right? Plop it onto the tray, flatten it out, and we go so on and so forth until all the pasta is cooked. A pair of tongs might be help, more, help, more helpful here. Yeah, a pair of tongs, definitely more helpful than uh, my spider. And then we're gonna assemble our lasagna. Flatten these out. Get the flat sheets if I can so they don't stick together. Little tears here and there, not a big deal. These are gonna be lay out in a tray, nice and flat. So we have our sheets of pasta that are cooked. We'll let them cool and then we'll assemble them. A little oil on top and we're good to go. Last thing we need to do is take the meat out of the sauce, let it cool a little, then shred it and put it back in the sauce. I'll get rid of the bones and then we assemble. Look at that, smells so good. Anything that comes off as far as sauce in this pan, in my, in my sheet tray, I'm gonna put back in, I'll scrape that back in, but um, the meat just gets shredded and put back in the sauce. Make sure you get all the bones out. See how nice and tender that is? Remember, we want this to be uh, not necessarily shredding and falling off. We want it to come off the bone fairly easy with just a little bit of tension. Good. Oh my gosh. Okay, go through it. Make sure you get all the meat out. All the short ribs are out. Take that little piece of orange out. You don't need it anymore. And we're good to go. We'll take this off, put it back in the sauce, and then we assemble. We're finally at assembly. I have everything I need. Shredded mutz, I got the mutz or mozzarella. My ricotta or my ricotta, uh, my cooked pasta sheets and my sauce. I'm gonna start out with my sauce. And like I said earlier, I shredded all the meat in my sauce. And it's just a nice meat sauce here. Okay, put the meat down with the sauce, get a nice sheet of pasta. If they're a little torn, not a big deal. I'll tuck it in there. Oh, look at that. What's great about the pasta that's homemade is that the sheets are super thin, right? And I want them to be nice and thin um, and they're gonna be uh, just a little finer than the stuff that you get in the store. A little more sauce. And I'm gonna make as many layers as I can. I want this to be layered really nice. Okay, a little bit of my mozzarella. Don't go crazy, you know? And then I'm gonna take the ricotta and just kind of do dollops of it around. And we'll take another sheet of pasta. What's great about these sheets is they fit in my pan. Uh, if you don't have, um, this, is a, um, this is a Pyrex pan. I like this one for lasagna. Um, I have little sheets here too. I can cut them in half. Like I was saying, I have little pieces. I could put my little pieces here to cover up my holes. Give me a little more sauce. Get it all around. Make sure your meat gets in there too. Oh yeah, oh my Lord. Okay, a little more mozzarella, and just keep going. Dollops of my ricotta. Okay, again, I'm not very shy with the ricotta. Another sheet of pasta, and again, like, if the sheet of pasta doesn't totally fit, right, I can break off pieces, patch it up, tuck it in, get, it, get myself another piece, put it over the top so I get a nice seal. Nice thin sheets of pasta. A little more sauce, look at that. Oh my God, delicious. A little more mozzarella, or mozzarella. Okay, some more of my ricotta. Sprinkle it around. Another sheet of pasta. Let me get a nice big one. Bam, 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 beautiful. Okay, tuck that in. Get my little, my little scrap sheets. Make sure that I unfold. Okay, I think I'm gonna do one more layer. Get a little sauce in those corners. A little more of the ricotta. Good. One more nice sheet of pasta. I'm gonna tear that. So they've fallen apart just a little, but it's still really good. Look at that. Okay, a little more sauce. And then I'm gonna to top with a little more mozzarella. I'm gonna put it in at about 350 just until it's bubbly. I want the edges to be a little crisp. And that is it, look at that. Uh, let's throw it in the oven. Let it cook, let it simmer away. Let it bake 350 until it's nice and brown on top and the edges get crispy. And 
We'll take it out when it's done. The lasagna is done. It actually was done yesterday. Uh, we had it in the oven after we assembled it at 350 for about 45 minutes. We took it out and let it cool. Uh, at that point, you could serve it. I'd let it cool for about 20 minutes so everything can kind of come together. If you take it out of the oven and cut it right away, it's going to be soupy. I personally like to refrigerate it overnight and then slice it and reheat it. I think it's better the next day. It's absolutely delicious. I sometimes slice it into, into like portions, freeze it, wrap it in plastic and freeze it. And then you have like individual portions that you can serve. I think it turns out wonderful that way as well. Um, that's how we do lasagna. I think it's delicious. I think that it's a great dish uh, to serve crowds, to have for a party, and you can do it a day ahead. That's the best part about it. Do it ahead, forget about it. Just gotta reheat it up. Let's taste. Man. So good. What I like about my version of lasagna is that it's creamy, it's meaty. The pasta is super thin. It's so much lighter than what's something you would buy in a store and boil off. It's got this light kind of like papery lightness that's absolutely delicious. I hope you enjoyed my version of lasagna. If you did, give me a thumbs up, like, subscribe. Hit the little bell if you wanna be notified when we have new videos out. We have merchandise, need salt, check the link below. Leave comments, we love to read the comments. I try and answer as many as I can. We now have a Patreon account as well. So if you wanna help support us making these videos, that would be wonderful. For the people that have already supported us, we love you, thank you so much. And uh, happy lasagna. I'm Chef Frank, this is Proto Cooks, thanks for watching. I wanna say a special thank you to Max Miller from Tasting History. Uh, he's got a wonderful channel. It was his idea to do lasagna, like the old way and the new way, and I was on board from the second. His channel is amazing, it's hilarious, it's funny. If you don't know him already, go check him out. I'll leave a link to his channel down below. Um, and it's just been wonderful working with him. Thanks a lot, Max.